I know Kanye West said you can't rely on your degrees to keep you warm at night, but I don't know. I think this could work. Hmm. Welcome to Module 7, Lecture 19 for Introduction to International Relations. In this lecture, we're going to cover the articles from the Minx and Snyder Reader in our module written by Eric Gartsky and Dan Dresner. So we're talking still about international economic relations, and we want to relate this to the likelihood that countries that work together through trade will be more likely to engage in peaceful relations with each other. So what are the sources of peace? Well, there are forms and practices of government. Uh, this is based on the writings of Immanuel Kant, who we've also talked a little bit about already. We know that from the democratic peace theory, democracies rarely fight other democracies, but that developing democracies are just as war-prone as developing dictatorships. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit more now about how this relates to IPE, or international political economy. So in the realm of free markets and private property, uh, we know that from writings by Montesquieu, Adam Smith, and others, that there's this idea that capitalism encourages cooperation among states by creating conditions that make war unappealing, like expensive, or unnecessary, and that economic freedom generally discourages conflict among nations. So, now getting to the meat of the issue, the capitalist peace, which is sort of a revision or clarification on the democratic peace. So the idea is that economic interdependence creates mutual value among countries, making war undesirable. But this requires that all states must value prosperity above perceived strength and resolve. So they have to all agree that prosperity for all countries involved is something that's more important than just demonstrating how powerful you are. So the argument is that economic freedom leads to peace for two reasons. One, free markets serve as sounding boards for political activity. If a country is engaged in genocide, uh, it will be very dangerous to invest there, and it'll be less likely that other countries want to support it financially. So in that sense, the, the trade flows, the financial flows that we can observe going in and out of certain countries tells us something about uh, whether those countries are viewed positively or negatively by other countries. And in fact, there are even people who work as consultants and their whole job is to do political country risk analysis to tell either other countries or companies whether it's a worthwhile investment to invest in one of these, these types of countries and then what kind of risks they might be undertaking if they decide to go to a place that maybe other companies or other countries are unwilling to because it's uh, dangerous or unstable or other things. Economies based on intellectual and financial capital are less dependent upon and less interested in occupying foreign territory. So because they've shifted away the emphasis of their economy from natural resource exploitation and toward more of a service-oriented economy that relies on things like intellect and global financial centers and institutions, that means that they won't have the same kind of drive to constantly seek out other sources of resources to exploit. So that would mean that they are focused more internally as opposed to trying to expand their territorial horizons. So what about the future of this idea? What can we expect in the next several decades? Countries with free and prosperous economies will likely contribute to the maintenance and deepening of international peace. But technological, social, military, or environmental change may affect the status quo. So these are viewed as kind of perturbations in the international system that can frustrate the likelihood that a longing peace endures as a result of interconnectedness and greater economic cooperation. So it's these countries that are prosperous that lead to the capitalist peace. So there seems to be a suggestion that more countries should adopt the same kinds of policies, or there could even be uh, an argument to be made that we should invade in countries and help translate them to more capitalist or capitalist-friendly societies, because then eventually that will be a situation where all countries are better off because there are fewer countries to be afraid of. 
and in, in addition, we have, you know, to acknowledge the variation among political leaders and political culture and different societies, different perspectives on conduct in international affairs may also result in conflict. So if you have leaders who don't care at all what anyone thinks of them in the international system and certainly are not working very hard to uh, adhere to international norms, I'm looking at you, North Korea, then we cannot necessarily say that those countries will be included in the fold of this capitalist peace. And that there needs to be a shift among developing countries to sources of wealth that cannot be acquired through conquest. So moving away from territory to the development and accumulation of capital. If we can wean these developing countries, the argument goes, off of their natural resource-intensive economies and toward more value-added, uh, service-oriented activities, then there will be less likely that there will be uh, corruption in societies where leaders are simply trying to make land grabs and things like that. So the solution, again, this is what the, ar the uh, author argues, is that developed countries must continue to promote capitalist institutions and practices. Then we're shifting gears to the, another article which is on the irony of global economic governance. So we know already about multilateral economic inst institutions, right? We've talked about the World Trade Organization. We've talked about the International Monetary Fund. There are others as well. What do they do? Well, they keep barriers to trade low. They reduce uncertainty for all the actors involved because they have a regular place to air their grievances or cooperate and resolve their differences. They facilitate communication. It fosters shared understandings. Uh, it, uh, the argument from this particular article is also that it prevented the Great Recession, which we experienced after 2008, from becoming another Great Depression. But... As the line goes from the popular Queen song, it's been no bed of roses, no pleasure cruise. So why is that the case? Well, the WTO has these rounds of trade talks every so often, and the Doha round in Qatar uh, collapsed completely. Uh, in uh, We've also seen examples where, like the WTO talks in Seattle, where People who were very uh, activists who were against globalization and the impacts that they believe it has had on, the, on their societies, on indigenous groups, on uh, their livelihoods, uh, tried to scuttle the WTO meeting and were able to prevent some of the meetings from taking place. But more recently, we have this Doha round that collapsed. Um, these, this is one of those talks where the countries all get together and they discuss important issues uh, pertaining to international economic governance. In 2010, the Toronto G20 summit uh, macroeconomic policy consensus broke down and Europe's sovereign debt crisis has escalated, right? We have seen the difficulty that the European Union has had in trying to uh, incorporate and fix uh, the fact that there are countries within the EU that are performing very poorly economically speaking, like your Greece's and your Portugal's. And then there are countries that are performing much better, like Germany, for example. And there's a question about whose responsibility it is to ensure that all the countries are solvent. And so Germany, for example, takes the perspective that uh, they shouldn't be called upon as sort of the police, the economic police, so to speak, of the European Union every time one of the more economically weak countries begins to falter. So uh, Europe has had a lot to deal with. And uh, that certainly, that, the question about the long-term sustainability of the European Union uh, has not been resolved. So what kinds of things can we understand from examining the great recovery to analyze the extent to which this whole global economic governance system has been successful or not? So the global economy has rebounded much better than during the Great Depression. Four years after the onset of the Great Recession, global industrial output is 10% higher than when the recession began. Extreme poverty is continuously on the downturn, and countries have become more open to global trade, not less. So if countries felt that because they were so interconnected and it resulted in sort of a, a viral uh, spread of the negative economic consequences during the Great Recession, then they might be inclined to retreat from that and not engage in 
more international trade because they realize that it opens them up to uh, possibilities of infection from other countries who are performing negatively, economically speaking. But in fact, what the reality has shown us is that countries have become more open, not less, to international trade. So how is it that these global institutions successfully address the global financial crisis? There's a few reasons. Central banks coordinated their action. Again, this kind of builds up into the liberal argument about why we have cooperation, why we have international institutions, because they serve a function that states in their own ways would not be able to accomplish without the assistance of these international institutions. They cut interest rates. They ensured unlimited currency swaps. Uh, the G20 countries tripled their international monetary fund reserves, which would help to facilitate lending, right? It greases the wheels of the lending opportunities. If there's no money to lend, then there aren't going to be, you know, more businesses being um, developed and more opportunities to leverage that debt and use it for something else, hopefully with the explicit purpose of expanding one's wealth. Um, the Basel core banking principles were revised to stabilize levels of bank capital. So basically, this is all a way of saying that global institutions did something. And what they did was positive, and it wound up helping the recession uh, not have as great an impact as it could have otherwise. So that is a way of saying that if we look at this particular example of the great recovery, then it suggests institutions matter. So why did the system work? Well, there was a shared sense of crisis that motivated the major countries to work together. Uh, U.S. leadership turned out to be stronger than expected. Partisan politics did not prevent the U.S. from acting. It could be that if we're looking at our own domestic politics, that the knowing that the United States has uh, a, an, a very large and impactful um, influence on the international economic system, the, the different political parties within the U.S. could perhaps put their issues aside because most people can get on board with the idea that we need to repair the American economy. The question is really how to go about doing that. So for a time, although it may be unimaginable thinking about where we are now, uh, within the, you know, the uh, executive branch and the legislative branch, we saw more uh, cooperation between those branches of government because the objectives that were being pursued to prevent further economic ruin and to help the American economy recover were deemed pretty acceptable by most people who are in office. Also, there are more multilateral economic institutions now than during the Great Depression, which is another way of saying that because of the density of institutions that have been uh, present in the international system, they perform more functions perhaps that can increase the efficiency and speed with which recoveries like this can happen.